right, welcome everyone. Um, if anyone joins us, we have one more seat. Uh, somebody can have a seat there. Uh, let me begin by opening us with prayer, and then we're going to get rolling. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are a good and gracious God, for you have made yourself known to us through your word, through your Son, Jesus Christ, and you have caused us to be born again to this living hope, Father. I thank you for everyone who's here. I pray that today you will enable me to articulate these reasons, these explanations, uh, as best I can, Father, for your glory, that we may understand and we may come to realize uh, even with greater confidence that our faith is a reasonable one, that it conforms to the evidence that what you have revealed about yourself conforms to reality. Father, and may you strengthen our faith, faith and prepare us to be better ambassadors for your gospel. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, my Savior. Amen. 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 All right. Welcome to week two. Last week was about the... Uh, just kind of the background of apologetics, the scriptural basis for it, our, our attitude as an apologist, our basic core understanding of how when we approach the presentation of arguments for our faith, that we start with the scripture and we argue out from there and demonstrate that all the evidence aligns with and holds to what Scripture tells us. And it is fraught with danger if we actually start with philosophy or some other man-made uh, system and try to argue to God, but rather we are in a stronger position to say, this is what Christianity says, now let me show you how <coughs> all of reality conforms to that. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to pick up right from there, and we're going to talk about the evidences for God, why we believe in God, the reasons why we believe in God. And I have a little handout here, um, fill in the blank, so you can take notes on it, here's some pens. First of all, I want to give credit, when I started putting this together and started organizing this, uh, I came across a resource that I decided to use kind of as my, my, my structural organizational material. Uh, it is a book called uh, Reasons Why We Believe uh, by Nathan Buzinitz or some name like that. I probably misspelled it or mispronounced it. Uh, but it's a, it, I thought it was an excellent resource. And so what I wanted to do is use that as kind of the uh, structural basis for how we're going to talk about this. So today, I'm going to give you 10 reasons why we believe in God. We're going to follow this up with reasons why we believe the scripture is true next week, and then the last week we're going to be talking about the person of Jesus Christ and why we believe what the historical record says about him and why we believe that he is divine and why we believe that he rose again from the dead. But today let's start with something very fundamental which is, why do we believe in God? Why do we believe that a God exists? And let's recognize that, you know, there's many people who find this idea of God somewhat distasteful. They, they reject the possibility that there could be a personal, all-powerful deity who demands repentance and worship from human beings. And so they, they reject it. They, they build their walls up against it, and we as a Christians, we're the people who say, no, we believe there is a God. And we come to them with really a presumption. And that, in fact, let me just say, the Bible, the Bible starts with a presumption that there's a God. And it, it doesn't lay out the big case from uh, science or genetics or anything else. It just says, in the beginning there was God, right? It starts with that presumption. And the Bible further on gives us then credible reasons to, to put our faith in the existence of this God. So society may reject his existence, 
Uh, and, and in do so, they reject what ultimately is the clear evidence that God himself provides. Because the Bible says, it says, claiming to be wise, they became fools, right? That's in Romans 1.22. Uh, it also says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God, from Psalm 14.1. The Bible says that to make the claim that there is no God is ultimately a foolish claim. A person might think that they are wise, but they are ultimately resisting against the evidence that has been provided to them, and they are becoming fools in it. So with that, let me give ten reasons why we believe in God. And I see I only have 15 minutes, 10 reasons, 5 minutes apiece. I'm going to have to keep booking here. So, <laughs> Reason number one is on your sheet. The reason number one is because God, tell me if I fill these blanks in, right? He has, he has revealed, uh, I can't spell that, revealed himself to us. Now, you might say, what? That's where you're starting? Yeah, that's actually where I'm going to start. Um, because I think this is probably the most foundational aspect of God, is that this God has revealed himself to us. We would not know anything about God, except that he has chosen to make himself known to us. Theologians talk about two ways in which God has made himself known to us. The first way is in what is called general revelation. Scripture says that man is without excuse because everything that God has created can be seen and that, and that they can look out and see that there is a God. That's called general revelation. God has revealed himself through his creation to us that he does exist. But even general revelation, though it can reveal some things to us about God, it can show us and tell us that God is obviously a powerful creator because look at the universe that he created. Look at the immensity of the universe. Look at the uh, intricate minutia of the subatomic world. He's obviously powerful. He's obviously intelligent. It doesn't reveal us anything specifically about what he expects of us. And that, theologians say, is what is called special revelation. He has revealed himself through the scripture. You know, we believe in God because he's made himself known to us through scripture through his creation, because he has made himself known to us through his word, and because he has made himself known through, to us through Jesus Christ, which is the word incarnate itself. And those are the reasons that we know God has created, uh, that we even know that there's a God. Psalm 19 is a, is a good uh, psalm to read, because read the first six verses, verses and you see that you know, the heavens declare the glory of God, right? It talks about how he has revealed himself, his glory through the heavens and what has been created. And then the next six verses talk about the word of God and how he has made himself known in his glory through the word. Um, so we, we do not claim to have found God, but rather as Christians we claim that God has found us. That it is him who has acted to reveal himself to us. We haven't, you know, uh, searched uh, in the ground and dug down and find and found a God. We haven't looked in the stars and seen a God. We don't find him, but rather he has found us. Um, and he has revealed himself to us through his word and through the scriptures. So, that's a very foundational truth. It, it is, it, it, the truth is that it is inesca inescapable to deny that God, through general revelation, has revealed that he is the creator and that through his word he has revealed himself to us. 
Let's talk about reason number two. Carol? Yes. Can I, I you may you stop and ask me at any point. I, I, of course, believe what you're saying, but I can just hear it now. Fine. What, what everything we have around me, the whole science thing. Yeah. And we're going to get to that. Okay. I promise you. Okay. But okay. Let, let me say, let me say, the, you you have to you have to. Uh, right now, there's a bunch of people who are who will argue. Well, why do you believe in Yahweh, Jehovah, the Christian God? Why don't you believe in Odin or Zeus or the spaghetti, the flying spaghetti monster? And my my the the correct answer is actually because none of those gods have revealed themselves to us, right? Those gods are figments of imagination. They have not, they have not created a universe and they have not revealed themselves through scripture and they have never become human and stood before us and taught us, right? Our God has, Yahweh has, and that's why we don't believe in those other gods. Now, let me tell you why I believe all those things, why I believe Yahweh is the creator of this, and why, why the spaghetti monster is not the creator, right? Um, and, but that is the distinction, is, is that he alone is God, and he has, he has taken action to reveal himself to humanity and mankind. Let's talk about the reasons now why we believe. And, and I'm going to build on these because the second reason is because the existence of our universe points to a creator. The existence of our universe points to a creator. This is a refinement of the first, first one. This is building on top of it. But, you know, the Bible repeatedly asserts that God created the universe, and without his creative work, nothing would exist at all. Um, it, the, Bible point, the, there's, the Bible points to the origins of the universe, and it not only explains what naturalism cannot explain, it also corresponds to our everyday experience. We know this law of cause and effect. Anything that comes into being, that starts being, has an, has an original cause. The Bible gives us an explanation for what that first cause is. It is a creator who stood outside of a universe and said, let there be light, let me create, and he spoke it into existence. So we understand that, that everything came about because, because something, someone had to start it. This, the big theological name for this argument is called the cosmological argument. It is the point in, and this is pointing specifically to this general revelation, to call it out and to say, what explanation is there for why there is all this stuff? Why is there stuff? Right? The, the naturalism cannot give an answer to this. This is the most intractable problem of modern cosmology. In, in trying to explain the universe, in trying to explain what, how this universe came to be, this is the intractable problem. They can, there is no explanation. Now, now you say, well, the scientists, the scientists, they still reject it. Well, the reason why they reject it is actually holding to a faith system. They reject it because naturalism presupposes uh, the absence of a creator, um, the absence of the supernatural. And so they deny the existence uh, and it's because of not what, not the evidence that they have. They deny it because of what they believe. What they believe is that there could not possibly be a creator. Therefore, we will deny it. And so, think about this a little bit, right? They, because they start with the presumption that everything had to come about by natural means, 
they come to the conclusion that there was no supernatural, right? It's a, it is ultimately circular reasoning, but it is a kind of religion in, in, in science that is in many ways no more different than any other belief system. So you've got two belief systems. Um, atheistic belief system that, uh, that argues that there is no, there can be no supernatural, and therefore fails to come up with any explanation for how the universe could come into existence. And a belief system in the supernatural that does explain it. So you've got, you got two intellectually sound belief systems, one that cannot provide explanations and one that can, just from a simple, a simple examination of the two belief systems one is more consistently solid because it can give explanations that the other one is just simply absent in doing so. And it is almost funny to try to watch the secular uh, scientists try to come up with explanations. I, I recently saw a video of a man who just wrote a book and his argument is that, well, stuff comes from nothing. It just does. And his and his and he, when he was challenged by the interviewer, well, where's your evidence? Well, well, it does happen. We know it happens because we have the universe. So stuff does come out of nothing. And, and then he got into string theory and particles and says, you know, that's happening all the time. And and the the interviewer just asked the obvious question: Where's your evidence? Right? You're making the claim that's something comes out of nothing all the time, that at a, at a quantum mechanic level that stuff comes into being, where's the evidence? And the guy, the guy was ultimately came up short. He makes a claim but can't provide the evidence for it. Um, so why believe there's a God at all? My answer is that, is that to suppose that there is a God explains why there is a world at all. Um, God is the explanation, and, it's, and he explains so much more. In fact, the hypothesis of the existence of God makes sense of the whole of our experience, and it does better than any other explanation that can be put, put forward. And it's the grounds for believing that it's true. We live in a universe that had to come from somewhere. Science gives us no explanation for it. They cannot. They can... They can put forth a theory of the Big Bang, but they give no cause for how that singularity, first of all, they're, they're, it's, it's theory alone, a theory that is untestable because it's, it cannot be tested because it cannot be reproduced. It was a one-time event, it was historical. It happened and we can't reproduce it. It's not like we can create a controlled um, a system that uh, where we can produce new universes and others where we demonstrate that it isn't produced. We can't repeat that experiment. It happened in history. We can't reproduce it scientifically. All we can do is try to give explanations for it and there is no explanation for why there is something rather than nothing. We believe in God because the universe points to creator. The, this is so... This, Take this down to another level, right? Why is why 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 is there a building? Well, there had to be a builder for it to have this building to be here. Why is that clock on the wall? Well, there had to be a clock maker to build it, right? Why is there a car in the parking lot? There had to be a car maker to build the car. Well, why is there a tree? Well, there had to be a tree maker. There had to be something that created the tree. If there wasn't a maker for this, there would be nothing. There is a creation, therefore there must be a creator. Reason three. I know I'm going to have to keep moving. Reason three. Reason three is because the order and design of life point to a designer. The order and design of 
life point to a designer. All right. This, in big theological terms, is called the teleological argument. So the first one is the cosmological, this is the teleological, and I'd have to look it up to spell it. So you're just going to have to figure that out yourself. Um, <laughs> um, but the teleological argument, um, again, the Bible asserts that God is the designer of all life. You knit me in my mother's womb, and I am well made, right? The scripture says, uh, Job uh, records God talking about, talking to Job like, were you there when I formed the earth? Have you ever looked at the Leviathan or the behemoth, which, which we're not quite sure exactly what those creatures are. We believe they're giant prehistoric animals that we only know about in fossil records. But he said, have you ever looked at them and the strength of them? I created that, right? God testifies over and over that the, that the design of life reflects his glory and his wonder, right? And, and modern medicine, medical and biological science, the more that we come to understand life, the more we are marveled at life itself and, and the fact that there is life, that even the simplest forms of life that we look at, bacteria, are still incredibly complex. I was reading just the other day about, about this little bacteria, which we've heard, seen, it, probably many of you have heard examples before about, that has this little flagellum. It has this, this essentially a little tiny motor system in it, so it can propel itself through fluid, right? And this, and not only does this little motor system have, have multiple intricate biological parts that allow it to rotate and switch speeds and direction. They just discovered that it also has a clutch system built into it so that it can actually go into neutral or change gears in effect while it's moving. And that's in the smallest individual single cell creature. We, the more we look at life, the more we are absolutely amazed by the overall complexity of it. The DNA model, molecule itself contains more information in it than all 33 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica. And it's not just randomly assorted information. It is, it is information that gives a very precise prescription about how proteins are to be constructed and organized in order to or, or how these amino acids produce these thousands of different proteins that exist in the cell. There, and also think about this, there's more in this universe than just life itself. There is intelligent life. There's us. There are, there are creatures in this, in this world that can not only live, but they can think about living, right? That we can, that we can contemplate and think through the, the ramifications of life and philosophy and logics and we can reflect on matter and we can, and we can understand that we are, we are something more than just biological chemical processes running around. We have this rational ability to think. And naturalistic mechanisms are, again, absolutely incapable of, of explaining this. People hold out the theory of evolution as the answer. But scientists, even today, are running away from the theory of evolution. And the reason is, is because it cannot conform to the evidence. The only reason it hangs on is because there is no alternative explanation for the pure naturalist. The person who is a, is a naturalist and must deny the creator, the only reason to hold on to evolution is because there isn't anything else. It's not because evidence. It's not because the evidence of biological science. It's not because of fossil evidence. Because those things repeatedly are demonstrating the silliness 
of evolution. Mo mo many biological scientists have already run away from the theory of common singular descent and now are proposing, well, maybe there had to be multiple different lines of descent. Um, every day they are finding fossils that even according to their own chronology are pushing back uh, or causing problems with their theory. Um, I just read the other day again about another an anthropod that they fossils that they're dating to 560 million years old now with far comp, more complex brain structures than they thought was possible half a billion years ago. They thought life was barely even crawling out of the ooze and now we and you know so they have problems fitting it together. The reality is the more you look at the design of life, the more you look at the beauty, you look at the design of Pick any creature, a hummingbird, a platypus, a fish, look at any of them and you will see, you will marvel at the design of these cre creatures fitting right into this. And I know I'm running out of time already, I knew I would do this. Um, mm -hmm. But fitting right into this, you have to understand, I think a very, another very compelling argument that is coming to light is what is called the fine-tuning argument. When we start to look at the universe, in fact, I, I read a book a while back called, called Just Six Numbers. The guy's not a Christian. He's a, he's a scientist in Oxford. Um, and, he, and he wrote this book. He's a physicist. He wrote this book called Six Numbers. Martin Rees is his name. And he talks about that there are these six mathematical constants of the universe that we have no mathematical reason why they are the values that they are. They could be any of those. Could the, the, the power of the strong gravitational force, the uh, power of gravity, right? And a number of, he goes through them. We don't know why they are these values, but if they were any different, even to, uh, you know, like one times 10 to the negative 13th in power, if they were just tweaked, any differently, no life could exist. Stars would fly apart, right? The galaxy would collapse on it. The universe would collapse on itself. There are, and we have no explanation. We have no explanation. It's as if this universe was uniquely designed for life to inhabit it, right? Now, he comes to the conclusion that, well, maybe there's an infinite number of universes and we're just lucky to be in this one. That's, that's why. That there's other universes that that have these values that diff, you know tuned to different values, e even even such things as where this planet is placed with respect to our sun. If we were if we were moved any closer, like in the position where Venus is, we'd burn up. Any farther apart, um, where where like where where uh, Mars is located, no life. Could exist. Um, the fact that we have a moon that causes ocean tides, it causes um, the ocean to be the giant cleaning septic system of the of the earth, allows life to exist. Over and over, every place you look, you see that there was obviously a designer who created this world uniquely for life to exist in it. Reason four. This one people don't think about a lot. I'm going to stop writing these because we're going to move it just to move faster. Because the continuation of the universe points to a sustainer. You know, the Bible explains that God not only created this universe and all of life therein, but he keeps it going. It says, he himself gives all mankind life and breath and everything. He says in Hebrews, it he upholds the universe by the word of his power. It says in Jeremiah that he set in motion the seasons and the tides, that he created the stars, and he keeps track of every one of them. And Isaiah, verse after verse after verse, tells us that God is actively involved in this universe, and there must be something that keeps it going. Or it would wind down, it would explode apart, Something has to keep it going. Example. You guys studied the atom in school, right? They talked to you about the nucleus of the atom and the electrons. 
And the inside the nucleus are these protons and these neutrons, all the basic physics that we all got exposed to somewhere in junior high or high school. Well, the protons are these positively charged particles that should go flying apart. They should repel each other. We know that two individual protons put together do repel each other. Something's holding them together. Scientists call this thing the strong nuclear force. That's its name. They don't know what it is, right? They don't know why it holds atoms together. They don't know what its source is. Something has to be holding it together or it would fly apart. The, uh, the, the second law of thermodynamic tells us that the universe is running down into greater and greater uh, chaos, greater and greater disorder. But where did all the order come from in the first place that created this? If it's been steadily losing all of its order, well, something has had to initially pumped it full of order um, in or and energy in order to in, in order to have a universe that is still running and still containing and still still sustaining your DNA that's in your body that replicates and forms new DNA and allows for the creation of new cells that whole process to continue life and to keep it going something is causing that to continue to sustain for life to keep going on itself God is giving evidence to us that he is the sustainer behind the universe reason five this one it is because the human sense of morality points to a lawgiver. This is called the axiological argument, big theological term. Um, and, you know, Scripture tells us that God's word is written upon us. Um, Romans 1 says that the work of the law is written on people's hearts because what can be known about God is plain to them. God, our creator, our sustainer, our designer, is also our law giver. Human, there is built into every human, every person, a sense, a deep awareness of the law of God, of justice, of holiness, that constitutes a reality that we need to recognize that that had to come from somewhere. Modern anthropologists try to explain it away as a cultural thing, that you believe what is right and wrong because that is what your culture tells you. But that doesn't conform to our understanding of all people. First of all, first of all, where did that originate from? That can't come about by random chance, by if the, if the argument of the secular is true, then we should see some societies in which theft is a value, right? It's something to be rewarded, and, mm -hmm. and other societies where it is not. We should see some societies where murder is considered a, a, vi a virtue and not a and not a deep sin. But the reality is you go to every human culture, everyone, and there is, though you find differences on the edges, yes, some people have different sense of laws and morality in that culture about like what is an age for a, uh, uh, a young person to enter into marriage, right? You still find the same common sense of laws and people. And I've heard this over and over, serving on the missions board. I've heard testimony of this. People go into some tribe that had never been known um, before in the mountains of Papua New Guinea, and they sit there and they learn the language, and then they decide, we're gonna start translating the Bible. And they say, we need to find a word for sin. Do these people have a word for sin? And they well, what, what is sin? And they start asking him, is it right or wrong? Is it right or wrong to uh, rebel against your parents? Oh, that's wrong. 
right? That's wrong. What about what about to take another man's wife? That's wrong. That's a yeah, that they they all agree that these things. In fact, in fact, you can almost go completely through the both tablets of the Ten Commandments and find that those things exist in every single culture. This came about because of some reason. Now it can be squashed. The human conscious can be can be. Uh, uh, burned over, right, by, by sin, and there is obvious evil in the world, right? The Bible gives us an answer for that as well. As the Genesis 3 account gives us the answer for why there is evil and rebellion, but the ideal of what is moral and what is immoral is very consistent throughout all of humankind, throughout all ages, um, and and again, let me just make another little subtle argument here. Um, even the question about evil presupposes a God. Because to even ask the question, is this, is this, why is there evil? Or is this evil? Presumes that there is some standard for good. So there are there is a difference between good and evil, and humans can recognize it. That is borrowing from the Christian worldview to argue that there is a difference between good and evil. You know, there are people who will claim that there's, there is, everything is relative, that there are no absolutes, and they don't really believe that, because they can't live their life that way. Um, Ask someone sometimes. So, so you think that it's okay to torture babies for the fun of it? I haven't heard a person yet who would say, "Yeah, that can be okay, right?" Because, because it is in it is written in their heart that this is wrong, right? So, reason six. Because. This one sounds kind of familiar, but it is because eternity is written in the hearts of people. The Bible says, Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, He has put eternity into man's heart. It is the theme of Scripture that God Himself is eternal, and mankind is, is mortal, but yet mankind dwells on thinks of, believes in, that there is something eternal, that there is an afterlife. And this too is evidence that comes from every society of all of history, that there is a belief and a conviction that there is some afterlife. Now, there are modern people who try to deny that, but they are in the minority of all of human society and cultures over time. Go back thousands of years and you see that um, the Egyptians believed, were convinced that they were going on into an afterlife, that they were going to persist beyond. Um, and, and so we don't, we don't necessarily come from this by trying to prove that eternity exists. The Bible doesn't try to prove that eternity exists. Rather, it makes the claim that it does, and that's what corresponds to the evidence that Pete, that we have throughout societies and cultures of time, you know, that though there are who will try to deny that there's an afterlife and say, well, this is all that there is, that that's nothing more than, than a very uh, unique and minority belief system. Um, and it is not a belief system that corresponds to what we see uh, throughout all of our anthropological studies and research. That we, they all indicate that there is a near universal belief in God, even among the, remote, the most remote people today, and they believe that there is an afterlife. Here's a quote from a noted atheist, Sir Thomas Scott. He reportedly said on his deathbed, until this moment I thought that there was neither a God nor a hell. Now I know and feel that there are both. 
and I am doomed to perdition by the just judgment of the Almighty. Mm -hmm. He came to realize. And he didn't turn at home? No. Oh, he, went to, right. he, went, uh, he went forward knowing that he was uh, going to be judged. If, it turned, if it, eternity is indeed written on the hearts of men, we would expect that the great majority of human beings throughout history and every culture would recognize and affirm that belief. And when we survey the data, that is what we see. Right? So I'm, I'm making arguments here that what we see conforms exactly to what the Bible says. Now, I'm not starting and trying to make solid, uh, trying to argue that there is evidence for an afterlife. I'm trying to say the Bible says that there is an afterlife. And if and the Bible says he has written the knowledge of an afterlife into our hearts. And if that is true, then this is what we should see. And that is what we should see. If you want to make another claim that there is no afterlife, then give an explanation, right, for the great societal anthropological data for why people believe that there is. All right, reason number seven. 15 minutes left. We can do it. Because life without God is ultimately meaningless. Um, the Bible, again, says, uh, tells us over and over that it is God who brings about that he has prepared in our hearts uh, service for him and that only God can put it there. Uh, here's another interesting quote from the great French existential philosopher uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. Is it Sartre? Whatever. Uh, he made this astonishing admission. Uh, he was a Marxist and an existential philosopher. Um, I remember reading that he denied his uh, Nobel Prize because he he didn't want to um, he didn't want to become recognized by some institution. But he said, "Despair returns to tempt me again. The world seems ugly, bad, and without hope." There, that's the cry of despair of an old man who will die in despair. But that's exactly what I resist. I know I shall die in hope, but that hope needs a foundation. He had no explanation for life. He was an existential philosopher that had this angst that there is no real meaning in life. We are born, we live, we die. There's no meaning at all in life. And he went on to promote this philosophy as 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 the reality, but the truth is that humans, humans do desire to have a meaning, and there is no meaning in life. That French philosopher, he's right. There is nothing but despair if there is no God. Um, but the Christian believer becomes, Scripture tells us, pleasing to God that we live out our life in love of God. Because we love Him, more than anything else, we find that worshiping and serving Him to be a profound joy. So we believe in God because, with, because if there is no God, there is no meaning. And let me make this argument as well. How can we even, at a really more fundamental level, how can the idea of meaning um, even making the argument about what is meaning, that that itself bears witness to a God. Because the existence of logic, the existence of universal rules that apply to it, the ideas of the laws of non-contradiction and other, other rational, logical arguments, from the Christian, they flow out of a divine mind. They flow out of the, the laws of math, the laws of science, the law, law aesthetics and ethics and everything that we would say bring about meaning in life and give explanation to life. They fall, they come from transcendent intelligence. Why are there laws of logics? Why are there even 
these ideas where, where things don't contradict each other and both be true. The only reason that can be is because there's a divine mind that established these, these laws of logic. If, I know this is getting kind of heady, and kind of philosophical, but it, when you, if somebody tries to use logic to argue against Christianity, they are really borrowing from the biblical worldview because the Christian has the explanation for why they can make logical arguments. They don't have the explanation for why they can even reason and make these logical arguments and why they can, they can attest to meaning. Only the Christian can do that. We could not have a logical discussion about the existence of God or any other topic if God did not exist. To do so presupposes that laws of logic exist. But if all is a product of random chance, then there is no rhyme or reason to our existence. There is no law, a logic, or reason unless something greater than chance is at work. And in fact, it is God who is at work. He created us to love and to worship Him. That's our purpose, and we never find true fulfillment or joy apart from pursuing that. Um, you know, uh, people talk about Blaise Pascal's uh, comment that God put a, that, that he created a God-shaped hole in man's heart, and I don't always particularly like that, but I, there is a truth to it that we have no meaning or purpose without God. And, and you can't even argue for a meaning or purpose if there is no God. So we believe in God because it gives meaning. Reason eight, we believe in God because the flow of human history conforms to a divine plan. The flow of human history conforms to a divine plan. There is a story in scripture of all of human history. Not only does each person have a purpose and moves forward through time fulfilling his purpose, but God, there is, there is a flow and a fulfillment of all of human history. God's sovereign work in history is most clearly seen in fulfilled prophecy. So we're going to talk about that more when we talk about the Bible and Jesus, but let's say right now that there is a tremendous success rate uh, to biblical process, uh, prophecy that cannot be explained by simply pure luck. Biblical prophecy um, has struck a 100% accuracy rate. Though there remain some prophecies still unfulfilled, the events that have transpired have exactly correspond to what Scripture has said, written hundreds if not thousands of years before. The Bible predicted the fall of Tyre in Ezekiel 26. It predicted the Babylonian captivity and the return of Israel in Jeremiah. It predicted the rise of King Cyrus by name in Isaiah. It predicted the destruction of Nineveh in Nahum. It predicted the rise and the fall of the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, the Greece Empire, and the Roman Empire in order and they all came and fell, as was it had said. Time after time, biblical prophecy has been proven to be accurate again and again. The prophets of the Old Testament and the prophets of the New Testament, the prophetic word that has been spoken has, is accurate. Every time, every time a shovel is put in the ground in... Uh, in Israel, they dig up an archaeological evidence that conforms to the history of the Bible or again to the prophecy of Scripture. The Messianic prophecies of the Old Testament are another testimony. They were written long before Jesus was born and prophets predicted that he would be a descendant of Abraham, he would be of the tribe of Judah, that he would be a descendant of David, that he would be born in Bethlehem, that he would suffer and die for his people, that he would, that he would end the violent nature of his death, that the nations would turn to believe uh, 
uh, the Messiah. These things have all been prophesied. This is not like the modern day psychics and prophets of our modern day who give general, you know, you know, I see for you happiness in your future. Um, no, they are down to small details and they are ful fulfilled. Um, you know, their <coughs> mathematicians have done, said, you know, what is the chance of just uh, 40, these 48 prophecies of Jesus being fulfilled um, accurately about where he was born. Even the, even, even the day that he entered in on, on the back of a donkey into Jerusalem, that very day it was predicted 483 years beforehand, down to the day, the very day, there was only one person who entered Jerusalem on that day that was predicted, and that was Jesus Christ. The, uh, the only possibility that he could, and these are things that he didn't even have control over. He didn't have control over where he was born, where he was born and when he was born, and yet he fulfilled all of them. There is somebody acting in human history to bring this all about, to conform to what is said, and that is another reason we believe in God. Reason number nine. Because miraculous events confirm the supernatural. Because miraculous events confirm the supernatural. The naturalist denies that there can be any supernatural and therefore must try to find explanations for miraculous events. They have to try to give explanations that they are false testimony, that they've been made up, that they have been misunderstood natural phenomena and they have to give those explanations but their explanations cannot fit with the evidence that we have that supernatural events have occurred. We know supernatural events have occurred for a couple reasons. Number one, just like every other historical event, how do we, how do we know the historical accuracy of anything that's happened in history? We do it by the testimony of the eyewitnesses who have seen it, whether it's supernatural or natural, it is no difference. That's how we attest. Are they an accurate? Are they a trustworthy um, eyewitness account of what has happened? That's one way, right? And so there are plenty of recorded eyewitness testimony to supernatural events having occurred. And in fact, even you know, even for many of Jesus' miracles, even people who were antagonistic towards him, they have recorded in like the Jewish Talmud about his miraculous events. They had to explain it away as he had the power of Beelzebub or he was filled with demons, but we, because we don't believe he came from God, but we do see the evidence that he gave, the, he, did, he healed the blind and he raised the dead. Um, they give testimony to that, even being antagonistic. The, the eyewitness testimony of Scripture, we're going to talk about this even more when we talk about the New Testament and why we believe the New Testament. But it is, it, 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 the people who wrote it were trustworthy writers because everything else that we, that we confirm by archaeological evidence holds true. Um, and and there were, there were the opportunity for those around at the time that they wrote and testified this to challenge them, and those challenges don't exist. So the, that is how we go about establishing historical reliability. The other, the other reason is, you know, the, the effects of some of these miracles can still be seen in human history. Um, a, couple, a couple interesting evidences. Um, well, number one, we already talked about the evidence of the universe. That's a supernatural act, and we have the evidence of this universe right in front of us. The languages around the world are evidence of God's supernatural act at the Tower of Babel, when he created the languages and the families and spread them apart. The presence of the Israelites in the uh, Promised Land um, as, pe as a people are evidence in ancient Israel there. That it was evidence of their exodus from Egypt and the miraculous events around that. 
the, uh, the presence of the church today is evidence of the miracle of Pentecost and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let me say uh, this. I, I've said this to someone before about what is the best, a very simple apologetic for God, very simple apologetic is this. I have never had dinner with a Moabite or a Hittite or a Jebusite, but I have had dinner with an Israelite. Hmm? Right? I have had dinner with a Jew. The Jewish people are still here today as God said they would be by his miraculous and sovereign hand. None of the other ancient peoples are identifiable at all um, in our cult, in our society, in our world, people today. Yeah, there is probably an, uh, somebody who is descended from an Amalekite somewhere, but how can you point to them? But you can point to a Jew and say, they still exist as a people thousands of years later because, because God said they were. Um, I'm just going to skip over a little part and jump right to reason number 10. And this is, I believe in God because other belief systems are inadequate alternatives. Let me just say, we've already touched on a couple, we I focused a lot on atheism because that's what Atheism is an inadequate explanation for the world that we have today. It, is, it cannot explain the design of life. It cannot explain uh, the evidence that we have before us. God, clearly, God, a monotheistic personal God is the explanation. It cannot be explained by pantheism, this belief that the universe is God because the universe could not create itself, right? It had, it had to be created by something outside. It can't be explained by any sort of polytheism because an ordered and created world would not be created, would not come out of a set of, um, of separate deities that are arguing uh, with one another. Um, in fact, in fact, this, the secularists are even, um, the, the evidence is standing so in their face that they are struggling with explanations. And I'm sure many of you have even heard about that. There are those scientists today who say, well, obviously life could not have come about on this planet. So maybe it arrived on another planet and it was deposited here. Either aliens brought it life here or this idea of panspermia, like bacteria hitched a ride on it on a meteor or a comet, and that, that got here because we can't explain how life arose here. Well, that is ridiculous on its face because it just moves the problem, right? It just moves the problem farther back. Belief in God is ultimately genuinely coherent with everything we know about ourselves and about our universe. It contradicts no known facts and it causes us to be able to make sense of so much that would otherwise be inexplicable. Those who deny God are left with questions. They're left with things that are inexplicable. They must live with cognitive dissonance because, they're, because they have to hold to evidence that cannot be explained. But the believer in God has explanation. He has reasons that he can hold to and believe and know that this is true. So I run to the end of my time. And I'm going to close this in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you that you have revealed yourself to us. That you have, by your great hand, found us. Found us as your people. And you have saved us. We have come to believe what you have revealed about Jesus Christ and about your plan of redemption. And I pray that, uh, that we will become stronger, more fervent and faithful believers, uh, thinking believers who know why we believe what we believe, that we don't just hold to a simple faith or, or a blind faith, but a faith that has reasons, that does give explanation to the world around us, and that other systems, they fail, 
they fail to give explanation. Help us to be able to articulate this when we are challenged, to be prepared to give an answer for why we believe what we believe. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ and for His glory. Amen. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.